Welcome to BFR Radio, a podcast dedicated to all things BFR. This podcast is proudly sponsored by sportsrehab.com.au, where if you want to buy your own BFR cuffs or you want more information about the type of training or you just want more information, this is your one place to go. And I'm your host, Chris Gavilio. Hi everyone and welcome back to BFR Radio. Thanks for listening. I'm sure we're all aware of the many benefits associated with blood flow restriction training. There's one area that I think has little recognition out there in the public and I really want to make you all aware of that and that's around the role of BFR and bone. And there's a great paper here called Blood Flow Restriction Rationale for Improving Bone by the group of Lonaki et al. Now as those who read a little bit in the area of BFR, Jeremy's done a lot of papers in a lot of different areas. So I think this is something that could have relevance for some people out there who may be predisposed to stress reactions or stress fractures such as endurance-based sports, especially in the elderly as we need to be aware of bone health as we get older. The way they introduced this paper was they initially started talking about the potential differences between high and low load resistance training. In particular, they showed that resistance exercise performed at 30% of 1RM to failure in four sets, this is with not BFR, elevated myofibril muscle protein synthesis to the same level as 90% of 1RM to failure. This went on to obviously say that there could be potential benefits of just performing low load training versus high load, as we know in certain populations this is quite hard to do. However, as you realize, performing low load resistance exercise to fatigue is actually quite hard. And this is where the advantage of blood flow restriction training comes in, in that at low loads, we can perform exercise to fatigue, but we don't actually have to perform as many reps as traditional, just plain low load resistance training without BFR. The importance around this concept of adding in BFR in low load training to fatigue is that subjects exercising to failure without BFR could potentially stop exercise premature of true muscular failure due to outside factors such as boredom. The other potential disadvantage of low load training is the loss of potential adaptation of bone with resistance training. Although low load resistance exercise to failure may have similar muscular adaptations independent of blood flow restriction, the adaptation to bone is potentially different. It has been known since the 19th century that bone architecture is adaptable to mechanical loading. Research since has proposed that bone strength adapts primarily to the peak momentary loads and that these peak loads originate from forces applied to the bone through muscular contraction or gravitational forces. A lot of studies have traditionally been done in animals. And so, for example, in one animal model, it led to a set of loading criteria necessary for stimulating structural changes in bone through mechanical loading. And these criteria include, one, the loading stimulus must be dynamic. Two, short loading periods are more osteogenic. This is something that we want. Whereas longer loading durations does not lead to further adaptations. So again, osteogenic cells differentiate and develop into osteoblasts, which in turn are responsible for forming new ones. This is favorable. And thirdly, the load must be higher than what bone cells are exposed and become accustomed to from their daily mechanical loading environment. And I know from as an SNC coach, these are some basic principles that we actually use in our own programming progressions. So furthermore, these loading principles have been supported by both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies in humans, confirming that adaptations in bone mineral density and bone geometry are better observed from high load training rather than training with low to moderate loads. So therefore, in this paper, it was reasonable to question the efficacy of low intensity exercise with or without BFR with respect to favorable bone adaptation. So the purpose of this manuscript was to discuss the mechanisms of potential benefits of BFR exercise on bone adaptation and provide rationale as to why low load resistance exercise to failure would be unlikely to produce these benefits. As I mentioned briefly before, a lot of these studies have been done on animals. There's been a couple on humans. So we've got to be able to look between the lines here with respect to a potential use for BFR and the rationale behind bone reformation. So respect to the mechanisms behind this, the mechanical loading of the skeleton is essential for maintaining bone structure and integrity, which is compromised during periods of skeletal unloading. Large strides have been made in the understanding of how the skeletal system perceives and responds to its physical and gravitational environment. 
human and animal models of disuse and unloading have been an extremely useful research design in understanding the effects that gravity and muscle forces play on the bone remodeling process at the tissue and the cellular level. Similarly, animal loading models have helped to describe loading characteristics such as strain type, magnitude, rate and frequency necessary to stimulate bone accretion. Bone cell culture studies utilizing fluid shear stress or cellular deformation have opened up new avenues into the molecular pathways that regulate bone turnover and cell communication. Together, these studies have alluded to the importance of bone interstitial fluid flow in the process of mechanotransduction. Therefore, this bone interstitial fluid flow has been recognized as one important factor in the role that BFR may play in bone reformation. During physical activity, mechanical forces acting on the skeleton are generated from muscle contractions, impact forces from contact with the ground, or a combination of these two. The forces result in tissue level strain that is recognized by the bone's mechanosensory cells and subsequently relayed to the cellular milieu to regulate bone remodeling. The exact mechanism by which the bone cells perceive tissue strain and convert it to a useful biological signal is not fully understood. However, the interstitial fluid flow hypothesis is becoming more widely accepted. During load-inducing strain, a pressure gradient occurs which is thought to propel interstitial fluid flow from an area of deformation to an area of tension, causing fluid shear stress on the osteocyte membrane or cell processes, leading to a biochemical response. In the absence of dynamic mechanical loading, it's been recognized that there's difficulty in the direct measurement of in vivo interstitial fluid flow. Therefore, measurement of intramedullary pressure have been used to describe the intraosseous pressure and fluid environment within the bone. The importance of bone blood flow and pressure on bone adaptation has long been recognized. Chronic or intermittent venous occlusion proximal to the bone or fracture site have been used to increase bone mass as well as accelerate healing of fractures. Chronic or intermittent venous occlusion proximal to the bone or fracture sites have been used to increase bone mass as well as accelerate healing of fractures, more so in animal type studies. In order to study the relationship between altered venous pressure, interstitial fluid flow and bone adaptation, several studies have been conducted. In one, they applied a 50 mm wide pneumatic tourniquet around the proximal portion of one hind limb, this is in a dog, and was inflated to approximately 40 mils of mercury. The venous occlusion caused by the tourniquet significantly elevated venous and intramedullary pressure of the tibia distal to the cuff. After 42 days of venous occlusion and normal cage ambulation, the tibia exposed to the increased intramedullary pressure had significantly greater periosteal new bone formation compared to the controlled tibia. Similar findings were reported in another study of goats that underwent 40 days of venous occlusion of the popliteal vein in one limb. The venous occlusion resulted in a chronic increase, 85% of tibia intramedullary pressure, as well as significant increases in tibial bone mineral density and periosteal and endosteal new bone formation. These studies have concluded that venous occlusion leads to an increased venous and intramedullary pressure, which may cause a pressure gradient possible, leading to increased interstitial fluid shifts throughout the bone. Further studies have also concluded that increased intramedullary pressure and interstitial fluid shifts caused by venous occlusion can directly influence bone adaptation independent of mechanical loading. This gives great support for BFR. A second potential mechanism by which blood flow restricted exercise could impact bone health is through activation of the hypoxia inducible transcriptional factor or HIF pathway and its downstream activation of vascular endothelial growth factor. VEGF. While the application of BFR during exercise primarily occludes venous blood flow, it may also partially restrict arterial inflow depending on the pressure of the cuff employed. This potentially causes an acute state of hypoxia in the tissues below the cuff. It is interestingly that this low oxygen tension or hypoxia has recently been shown to be a potent stimulus for activating the HIF pathway in osteoblasts leading to increased expression of VEGF and the subsequent micro blood vessel formation and invasion of damaged bone tissue after fracture. To date, there's only been two studies that have measured HIF levels in humans after an acute bout of BFR exercise. 
In one study, they found that HIF expression was increased following four sets of bilateral knee extension at 20% of 1RM at 200 mils of mercury with and without BFR restriction. And there was no difference between the conditions. And using a similar exercise protocol, another investigator found no changes from baseline levels of HIF protein expression, suggesting that the energetic or the hypoxic stress was not occurring to a significant extent. However, it was conceivable that measurable changes in protein expression occurred at later time points. It seemed to be that this was a conceptual idea that needed further investigation. The second point in this article was the efficacy of BFR exercise and bone. Changes in bone mass are the result of two counteracting metabolic processes, bone formation and resorption. Both of these are regulated by hormones, growth factors, cytokines and mechanical loading. Although no long-term studies, greater than six months, investigating bone mineral density following BFR exercise have been completed, some studies have investigated the acute changes in bone metabolic biomarkers following BFR-restricted exercise. Although these markers are not without limitations, they are able to provide a snapshot into the dynamics of bone metabolism in response to exercise. For example, in a three-week chronic low-intensity walking study with BFR, they compared to regular low-intensity walking. They walked two times a day at 50 meters per minute for five two-minute bouts of exercise with one-minute rest between each bout, either with or without BFR. The pressure ranged between 160 to 230 mils of mercury. However, the exact area in which the pressure was applied is unknown from the methods, nor was the cuff size reported. Results of this study found that significant increases in muscle cross-sectional area, muscular strength, as well as serum bone-specific alkaline phosphate, BAP, in the blood flow-restricted exercise group, which was not observed in the group walking without the BFR cuffs. Although the exact function of BAP is not fully understood, these levels have been considered to reflect osteoblastic activity and can therefore be used as a proxy marker for bone formation. Another study investigated BFR on serum bone markers in older men. This chronic six-week study compared the effects of either low-intensity BFR or high-intensity resistance training on serum BAP and another marker of bone resorption called CTX. For the low-intensity BFR group, exercise consists of one set of 30 repetitions followed by two sets of 15 repetitions with 30 seconds rest between each set at 20% of 1RM. BFR restriction pressure started at approximately 160 to 180 mils of mercury and progressed upwards to 240 mils in the latter weeks, which was applied over a 50 mil wide cuff. The BFR restriction was constant throughout the rest intervals, but the cuffs were deflated for 5 to 10 minutes between the leg press and the knee extension. The high intensity group completed three sets of eight for leg press and knee extension with 90 seconds rest between sets. This study found that despite the lower intensity of exercise, the addition of BFR resulted in an increased BAP and the ratio of BAP to CTX to similar levels as seen with higher intensity exercise group. Once again here, we're seeing an advantage of the additional BFR stress onto low intensity exercise to be very similar to the response of high intensity exercises. And as we can see in an older population, this has major advantages. The final perspective on this, but these studies support the hypothesis that training with BFR restriction may provide not only a novel modality to induce adaptation in muscle, but also bone, which was previously thought to only occur with higher intensity impact type exercise. As it's pretty obvious here, there's longer term training studies need to be completed in order to investigate whether or not elevations in bone markers translate into favorable bone adaptation with BFR exercise. In addition, they also mentioned the degree of BFR restriction may also be an important variable to consider with respect to bone formation. Many of the pressures used in the literature range from 160 to 240 mils of mercury, and it's potentially evident that these use a narrower 50 mil cuff as seen in systems such as the Katsu Master Cuff. Therefore, it was conceivable that perhaps greater pressures may elicit a greater response. However, this is currently unknown because no investigation has looked at the different cuff widths. As we could also extrapolate here, additional studies including women should be completed since all the studies have been completed on men and maintaining bone density is even more important in women. Their final concluding points here was that although similar muscular benefits may be observed from low intensity exercise performed to failure, the response of bone might be different. Therefore, this highlights the importance of blood flow restriction stimulus. 
My concluding thoughts on this is that I think this potentially has some role in that rehab recovery type stage, but also endurance-based sports where they traditionally may be predisposed to stress reactions and so forth. For a period of time, I've actually worked with quite a lot of endurance athletes and in particular in the sport of triathlon. And I know that in the groups that I've worked with over time that they've obviously been exposed to a high incidence of stress reactions. And when you take this evidence, and I've seen them lift, and because they do such a high aerobic catabolic type load, they're actually unable to lift a lot of load in the gym. Therefore, being able to couple strength training with the additional BFR using the proposed mechanisms outlined in this paper, and also that the BFR stimulus may be able to provide that strength improvement that they traditionally can't get because they just can't lift a lot of load, that this may potentially be a really good addition to their training. So here the benefits are their strength gains, and then secondly is their potential bone reformation markers. I look at this as, is the use of BFR in endurance athletes a potential insurance against the high incidence of stress reactions? It's never going to obviously decrease it totally. It may actually help them somewhat in their preparation as an athlete. And that's where we're going to leave that paper today, BFR and bone. A little bit different, but I hope you can get something out of that. And once again, I, I always think with endurance-based athletes, it, this really has something to offer. As I alluded in my concluding thoughts, I really do think this has its place in endurance-based sports. And if we're able to put them in a better position to be a little bit stronger and give them the increase in markers that they're needed to help prevent stress reactions, I think it really opens up the options to the strength coach to deliver a much better program for their athletes. However, once again, it's a tool in the toolbox and I think we always need to recognize that. And on that note, we're going to now go over to how you do BFR. And today on How You Do BFR, I have got Winter Olympian Jackie Narricott. Welcome aboard. Hello, thank you. I'm actually Jackie's strength coach. I've been working with her for a few years now, so it was really exciting to see her make her Olympic debut this year in 2018 in Pyeongchang in her sport of skeleton. Firstly, congratulations on your Olympic debut and just probably explain a little bit about your background into the sport and then possibly what is skeleton. Thanks for having me. So for those of you who don't know, skeleton is a winter Olympic sport similar to bobsled, um, where we go down essentially an iced water slide, head first at about 130, 140 k an hour. That's crazy. So you have an acceleration zone within that. So how, how far is that acceleration zone? So we start essentially like a sprinter, but with my hand on my sled at about ankle height. Um, and then we've got about 30 meters roughly is how long we run at the start. Yeah. You say, and, and also Jackie's now based at Bath as well, so very famous training facility over in Europe where uh, you've had a lot of female Olympic champions and also you're engaged to Dom who uh, won bronze yep. at uh, the recent Pyeongchang, so that's uh, pretty exciting to, to be amongst that group of people and train in that same area. Yeah, it was, it was fun, particularly getting tra trained with Dom and then in the same environment as the Brits was, was a good experience. Yeah, definitely. And your background's obviously in track and field? Yeah, sprinter and jumper. And those who in track and field, your surname may sound familiar and everyone probably asks you this question, but there's a famous Australian sprinter, Paul Narricott. He's your uncle? Yep. Yep, so he ran, what did he run? He was a 120 meter sprinter. He actually beat Carl Lewis over 60 meters indoors one time, which was pretty cool. No, that's a, that's, that's a pretty good one to tell your grandkids. <laughs> yeah. So for an Australian to actually make it, internationally in skeleton or any winter sports what we call a minnow sport i think is you know is, is an incredible achievement nonetheless and so i've had the pleasure of working for a few years and jackie's a classic track and field or a sprinter she's strong she's powerful so really great to work with you can do all the classic lifts and actually get now that she's getting a bit more old and, and a lot more experienced a bit more adventurous with what we do in the gym Jackie's actually incorporated BFR into her own training and her own methodologies, and she uses it in several different ways, so I thought it'd be really cool to listen to her story about how she's been able to incorporate it into her preparation. Basically, the, I think the biggest one on tour is we use it as part of my warm-up. So instead of having to go outside where it's minus 10 and puff time snowing, I can stay inside for an extra 10 minutes, still get warm, but without having to worry about dealing with the, the elements, which is, I think, a massive benefit. So she uses as what we call pre-ischemic conditioning, 
or in other words, like a passive potentiator. So how, how do you actually use it? So run it through what you would do. So after like all my mobilization stuff, then I'll put it on, pump them up for two minutes and go two minutes on, two minutes off. Usually with the so three sets of that, the last set I'll usually do a few squats and a few jump squats just to try and get things going a little bit more. With them on? With them on, yeah. Yeah, with them on. And then you take them off and then what would you do after that? Go through my normal... Essentially, my normal sprinting warm up, which changes depending on whether we're race day or whether we're not. Sometimes it's a little bit shorter. Yeah, and so Jackie will also use this as part of her pre normal sprint training session as well. And just as a comparison, how would you, how do you feel prior to using BFR to how you feel warming up to the session? What's the difference? I think it, it helps with the energy levels. So having used it means I can kind of stay a bit more relaxed, warmer, definitely. So that when I then go into warming up, there's that bit of extra juice in the tank, which is always useful when you're then trying to stand on a block and run as fast as you can. Definitely. And probably the, the challenge which people don't also realize when you're traveling and competing at these competitions is first, as you mentioned, it's minus 10. It's very cold. So you need to stay as warm as possible. And as we know, there's a lot of really great evidence around the ability to maintain muscle heat. So for every degree change in muscle temp, you have about 4% change of power. So that really significant in cold temps. But I would imagine that your warm-up facilities in some places are quite poor. <laughs> uh, that's an understatement. Um, for the most part, we are warming up in car parks. On concrete and on bitumen, half the time it's wet and slippery. And then it's usually only, we're lucky if we've got about 60 meters to play with. Wow. And you probably, how many athletes would be there? On World Cup, during training, 30 to 60. And then on race week, because it's usually just the girls, they'll be 25 to 30. So pretty busy in a small space. Yeah. Yeah. So And you've been able to obviously incorporate that, save some energy, feel a little bit more active prior to your actual race, which is advantageous over how long does your season usually run for? We're away for about five months. Of that nine weeks of that is high-intensity racing. Yeah, so anything where you can save some energy, I think, is, is a major benefit. Yeah. So that's your, your first major example, and you've actually been able to incorporate a couple other ways. Do you want to just explain yeah, other ways you use it as well? So we've also used it in the gym. Being a skeleton athlete, our backs tend to take a pretty pretty good beating on tour. So we, we've used it in the gym to try and get rid of, basically so we can reduce the load going through my spine. But then also in Pyeongchang, the gym was terrible and packed leading into race day. So we ended up just using it to do my power session. It was only supposed to be a short session anyway. But to be able to go, well, we've got bands and we've got we've got space back in our little apartment to get out of the gym and still get the same benefits it was really useful. So I remember that Jackie actually sent me a text saying, gym's crap, it's packed, can I just do a band and BFR session? And yeah, she's right. Like, you know, at the end of the day, all we needed to do is all she needed to do, sorry, is just to get some activation through the muscles and get that working. And when you kind of separate saying, well, are we trying to reproduce a movement or rather that just get the physiological benefit, it's kind of like, well, hey, that was a great call. She actually filmed some of it. It was a really short, sharp session. Yeah. And also at major champs, traveling is a stress, isn't it? Yeah, that's an understatement. So throughout North America, we fly. And then there's usually a couple hours worth of driving either side of those flights. And then in Europe, we drive everywhere. So most of the time, I think the shortest road trip we had last year was six hours. So being able to, yeah, reduce any sort of stress. Yeah, and and like Olympics, you can't reproduce that kind of stress. So even having to worry about going from the accommodation to the gym, and I imagine in winter, it's snowing, so... It's not like you can get a nice walk in the park either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that was a r- really great example of the advantages of using BFR and bands or, you know, bands and gym in a box, you could almost say quite convenient. So that was really ingenious from Jackie. She's actually done some stuff with uh, electrostimulation as well. So she, she incorporates that into a lot of her training. Do you want to just briefly explain about that? I know it's a bit off topic, but that's quite a cool thing that you do. Yeah. So in Whistler, because Whistler is a track that, is very physically demanding. Trying to slide down that track and get gym sessions is a bit too much on my body. So this way we can use the EMF machine to still get some sort of muscle stimulation going without having to put any sort of load through my body. I can sit on the couch yeah. and relax. Yeah, and when you look at some research, we think we have to train all the time. And you, you know the stresses associated with racing and competing and traveling, you just actually need to deload. You need to listen to your body. And that's one thing I found with Jackie is that over the years, you've actually matured as an athlete and to say, I'm actually tired, 
I need to do nothing or rest or do something with a really low load. So that's, that's been a really cool uh, journey when you sit back as a coach and watch how an athlete has actually matured. Perhaps just recently you've used it really effectively in a third way as well. Yeah, so I've been battling an Achilles issue, we'll call it, um, pretty much since I got back in May. And we've been using it as a way to warm up and get some sort of pain relief from Achilles. We put it around my calf and then I've been doing isometric holds and then also a few calf raises to try and get some sort of movement going through it as well. When you look at a lot of traditional tendinopathies, we tend to treat it with isometrics and tend to be heavy isometrics. How do you do that when you're traveling and so forth? But also coupled with that, BFR has actually been shown to attenuate or decrease joint and tendon pain. So he's, you know, Jackie's combined the two methodologies. She's getting great activation. She's getting decrease in pain in the Achilles and she actually feels like she can can train. So really three great ways of bringing something in together as one tool of many things that she does in her toolbox. So anything else you wanted to add about BFR that you've found? I like it. There's been a lot of people, a lot of comments when I first brought it out on tour, kind of being like, what on earth is that? And then they all kind of get a little bit jealous when I get to sit inside and spend an extra <laughs> 15 minutes out, not, not in the cold. I love it for, for traveling and it's just it's nice to know that we've got that back up there. If the gym's shut, the gym's terrible or I'm just tired. Yeah, and I think that's that's key also is that there's no sub- – I've said this before. There's no substitute for lifting heavy. You, you yeah. st- as a power strength athlete, you need to lift with load, but it's nice to have this in your toolbox. That's a really great summary, so thanks for that. You're about to head overseas. Yeah, so October the 14th, you're heading over. What's your season comprised of? Uh, we'll do a little bit of training in Canada first and then go across to Europe for the first couple of races of the season. The first World Cup I'm competing in is the 12th of December, I think it is. And then we'll go through Christmas break, do a few more World Cups, and then back across North America, which is where Worlds are this year. Finish that, and then back to the warmth. Yeah, lovely. So all the best. Good luck. And obviously, Jackie's on social media and has a website, so you can follow her journey. The best places are? Probably Instagram and Facebook. So how do they find you on Instagram? What's your handle? It is uh, Jack underscore Narakot. J-A-C? J-A-C, yep. So I'll put this on the blog as well, and obviously when I Instagram this out, and your website again? Website is Jacqueline Narakot, or one word, dot com dot au. And Facebook? Is Jacqueline Narakot. So yep. thanks for your time <laughs> and all the best. Thank you. And uh, thanks for listening. And that's all today for this episode of BFR Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to take part in the podcast, please contact me through my website or on social media channels at Chris Cavillio. For more information and to order a set of your own BFR cuffs, please visit my website at sportsrehab.com.au. Thanks for listening and keep the pump. (laughs) 